Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the MedDesign Podcast, where we explore the unique journeys of medical innovators. And today, we're delighted to welcome our guest, Dr. Tom Sorrentino. Tom is a General Surgery Resident and Surgical Innovations Fellow at UCSF, where he's actively involved in the development of cutting-edge medical devices and technologies. With a strong foundation in biomedical engineering from Yale University and a passion for surgical innovation, Tom is at the forefront of bridging clinical practice and research to transform patient care. Tom's work at UCSF's Surgical Innovations Program has not only positioned him at the cutting edge of medical device innovation, but is also leading to significant advancements in surgical practices. His unique journey offers a fresh perspective on the integration of engineering principles in the field of medicine. His deep knowledge and hands-on experience in the realm of surgical innovation make him a remarkable guest for our podcast. We're eager to delve into his journey his work in medical device development, and his vision for the future of surgical innovation. So without further ado, let's dive into our conversation with Dr. Tom Sorrentino. Welcome. But Jarrett and Ty, really pleased to be here, and especially thank you to Ty for inviting me to be on the podcast. We're happy to have you. Just to get it started, can you tell our listeners about your current role as a general surgery resident and surgical innovations fellow at UCSF? Yeah, so I am in my fourth of seven years general surgery training at UCSF. So for people who aren't familiar, most academic general surgery programs are five clinical years, so five years when you're in the hospital, and then two years of what's called research or more now more commonly professional development time where we have two years, it's a gap in the middle, and you can go off in whatever you want, basic science research, global health, clinical research, or you know more and more commonly programs are starting to offer some version of uh, medical device innovation, surgical innovation, medical device development. There's a whole bunch of different names for it. And so I'm just on the tail end of my first of the two years of my professional development time within the Surgical Innovations Fellowship Program at UCSF. And so we're housed a joint between the bioengineering department at UCSF and then housed under pediatric surgery because UCSF and Stanford have a joint pediatric device consortium that does some of our funding. And so our group is the legacy of someone named Mike Harrison, who's one of the sort of big innovators in pediatric surgery and needle surgery and the whole like innovations group, at, surgical innovations group at UCSF founded under that and, and continues now with two surgical innovations fellows every year. Awesome. And it's looking into your background a little bit. It's really interesting how you've got your biomedical engineering background and your passion for medical device innovation now with the surgical innovation as well. And maybe can you tell us your most interesting or innovative project that you've worked on? Yeah. So probably the thing that I am most, most interested that even though it's not my full-time job, I probably spend a full-time job on because it's, I really think is hopefully going to change one aspect of the field is something called the, the kidney pod. And what this is, it was actually started by a resident a couple of years ahead of me in the UCSF surgical residency program for his professional development time. He did the Stanford biodesign program, which some people may be familiar with. And so his name is Keith Hansen, and he basically, the biodesign process, developed a device to keep kidneys at a specific cold temperature, about four degrees Celsius, while they're being sewn into organ transplant recipients. So the sort of big problem is that patients who get kidney transplants, they do a really good job of sort of temperature control of the organ. So in order to prevent cell death and necrosis, you want that organ to be not totally frozen, but right about four degrees Celsius. And so they get it down to four degrees Celsius really fast when it gets taken out of the donor, usually a bit of different hospital. And then there's all these sort of fancy devices. The sort of most prominent one is this life port kidney pump that can regulate the kidney right at four degrees Celsius all the way through the transportation phase, which sometimes can take up to 24 hours. But what we effectively have is a last mile problem where all that great temperature management sort of gets thrown out the door at the recipient operation. And so in the 30 to 60 minutes that it takes you to sew in the kidney, that kidney warms up from the four degrees Celsius where it's supposed to be all the way past room temperature within 10 to 15 minutes. And there's a lot of good clinical data to suggest that if you can eliminate this warming injury you can reduce what's called delayed graft function, uh, which is when patients after their kidney transplant have to go back on dialysis for a certain period of time. Sometimes it's only a day or two, but sometimes it's months and months. And so obviously no patient with a kidney transplant would want to have to go back on dialysis to 
surface. But the bigger picture is that we think there's about 3,000 kidneys a year that get thrown out because they're what we call marginal, and which means that the surgeon thinks that with that extra warming injury that they get when they sew them in, the kidney is not really going to fly. And so they end up discarding them. And so we think that we could, with this device, which will keep the kidney at four degrees Celsius for the duration of the sew in, we think that we can increase the number of transplants that get done and then also enable robotic transplantation with the sewing times are even longer, just because it's a little bit technically more difficult, but it's a new hot thing. Um, and so we're hoping that this addresses a number of the sort of challenges that kidney transplant surgeons face as they're going to sew in these kidneys and should ideally significantly improve the outcomes for these patients and enable more patients to have access to really what is a limited resource, which is organs. It's an interesting thing in that this is not a new problem that people have recognized, but usability is a big thing. And so while I can't get into the specifics of the design, we've designed it in a way that is as surgeon friendly as possible so that, you know, if you're a surgeon, you want to use this. Not that it's something that interrupts your workflow, but that you can't wait to get your hands on it. it is design and usability has been a big part of the, the uh, process here. Am I touching up design and usability so that surgeons want to use it? Because that's just an interesting topic in its own right. Yeah. So I think for anyone who's here or who knows surgeons, that they tend to get, especially as you move through your career, pretty stuck in your ways. You like, especially for operations that are the same. So like a kidney transplant, ideally you want to do it about the same way every single time. That's what breeds success, right? And so if a surgeon has a set way of doing something and you're going to introduce something new into their workflow, it either has to, if it's going to take a lot of extra effort, it better significantly improve that patient's outcome, or it needs to be something that is going to be so seamlessly integrated into the workflow that they're almost not even going to notice it, or it's going to make their life easier. And so what we saw is we did this sort of competitive analysis, understood the landscape of what had already been done in this space. We realized that the, a lot of the existing devices had usability issues where they'd have different things that were connected to them or whatever the cooling agent was had to be exchanged and it increased the amount of time it took the surgeons to sew in the kidney. We use really fine sutures to do this that are like barely thicker than a sort of human hair. If one of those gets caught, you basically have to start over. So everything has to be very easy for the surgeon to use. And I think one of the things that has gotten people really interested in this device when we show them the prototypes is that it should add 15 seconds to their workflow and it actually helps them do the surgery a little bit easier to do some of the features that are designed into the device. And I think that at least in our early discussions has helped separate us a little bit from some of the prior projects that never really left an academic lot. But yeah, usability, you want a, a happy surgeon, give them a device that is simple to use and intuitive and has packaging that's designed well and all the sort of design aspects that go into it, I think really can't be undersold how important that is because it can be the death knell for what otherwise might be a great device, but if no one wants to use it, then you're never going to go anywhere with it. Which that's such a big gate for, I guess, medical devices that's until you get to a commercialization stage is when it ultimately becomes the test. But those previous steps, and I guess that's something that is a vision for putting this device together where... That's been a priority in part probably because you are the user. And I guess from the founding standpoint as well, yeah. I'm curious for the profile or the personality of the surgeon who would adopt this. You've got the, the diffusion of innovation is always a challenge. And if you've got some surgeons who are set in their ways and more so than others who are perhaps new and willing to adopt new techniques, have you seen like profiles for adoption? It seems like usability helps to short circuit that reluctance for adoption, but yeah. Yeah, it does. I think some of the other conversations that we've realized that we've had showed us that there are some surgeons who think that they can defy the laws of thermodynamics in a sense where I don't really need this because all of my kidney transplants take 15 minutes. So I'm very fast and I don't need this. And the reality is that no one is perfect. And so maybe you approach that surgeon in a different way. The other thing is that most kidney transplants are done at academic centers where there's a surgeon, and then someone like me, who's a trainee, right? And so I've done maybe 30 or so kidney transplants in my training so far, but I'm not nearly as fast I'll help them as a surgeon who's been doing for 10, 15, 20 years. And there's lots of pressure in the operating room to get these done fast. I've been on the receiving end of the go 
like everyone being very stressed and having a device like this actually lets you slow down and allows the surgeon to be able to teach, right? And so one of the benefits that you might sell to that surgeon who says, I'm faster than God, is that, well, but you love teaching and this is going to let you spend the time to really teach your residents how to do these operations well without worrying about any side effects for the patient. And so I think one of the things that we've learned that's a really good lesson for anyone starting to design to make a new device is to really do those early user interviews and understand a sort of variety of perspectives about why someone might want to use your device. I think that's something that a year ago before I started this, I didn't really appreciate. And now having seen lots of worked on this project and other ones and seeing lots of other people talk about their projects, I think the ones that tend to be more successful are the ones that really understand the landscape of all the stakeholders and their motivations. And if you can do that, then I think that even though it's really early on that you're understanding that three years down the road, that affects your marketing plan, right? Three, four or five years down the road. And so you can use that both upfront for your design in the actual device and then down the road when you're trying to figure out how to convince people to use it. Yeah. A good friend, Dr. Harlan Myers has four questions he asks. So who cares? So what? Who pays? How much? Yeah. And so what you've addressed is the who cares and the so what. And you gotten into yet of who pays and how much? Because that yeah. like who pays in the hospital system is always a completely different set of stakeholders. Yeah. So I think he hits that right on the nose. One of the things that this device has benefited substantially from mentorship through UCSF, Stanford Biodesign, and then the team at Fogarty Innovation, which some people may be familiar with. This is a medical device incubator and accelerator that was founded by Tom Fogarty of Fogarty Embolectomy Catheter fame, one of the most well-known serial medical device developers and entrepreneurs. And we had the good fortune of going through their invention accelerator program. And one of the things that they harped on us is beginning with the end in mind. And the end, as say, are that the device needs to be used and it needs to be paid for. And so the used part we talked about, the paid for part is equally important and complicated. And without getting into all the details, transplant reimbursement in particular is quite complicated and how all these devices get paid for. But I think the big thing that we've seen in pitching this device to both the grants and grant funding agencies internal things that you see in Stanford and externally is that we actually figured out a, an approximate cost for the device that's value-based that we did some economic modeling and we engaged really early with reimbursement specialists to try to understand how this is paid for so that when we went to people that's always going to be one of their questions and we could say with relative certainty you know this is how it's going to get paid for based on predicates x y and z and we think based on this model that we put together, that this is roughly what we could sell for. This is our COGS, so we're going to have X margin. And you can't forget about those things early on. But again, a year and a half ago, that would have been so far from my mind as someone who's squarely focused on the clinical part and the engineering. But later on, we can talk about how you raise money for these kinds of things. But you don't know that kind of stuff. People are going to be much less willing to give you money. Yeah, I think actually that really teed us up for our next question that we had for you as well, which is, what are those challenges around bringing new medical devices to market? There's regulatory hurdles, funding hurdles, interdisciplinary collaborations, and just so many things along that process. Throughout your experience, what would you say are some of those hurdles that you've encountered so far? Yeah, I think, again, being relatively new at this, one part of it is just coming from an academic and engineering background, like a clinical surgery background and engineering background, and very little knowledge of all the business side of things. And so I think one of the biggest lessons has been be open-minded, understand that there's almost nothing that you know right now, and that you're going to every day have to be learning new things and stuff that I never thought I'd be doing as a surgical resident, like understanding how venture capital deals are structured <laughs> <laughs> and reading like entrepreneurship books and stuff like that. I never thought I was going to be doing that kind of stuff, but I think that immersing yourself in the sort of business side is actually really important. The other sort of hurdles that I've seen for both of my own projects and then other projects that have been spun out of academia, and these are mostly specific to devices, but not unique to it, is finding good engineering partners. I have an engineering background, but I don't 
have a, like in an academic sense, but I don't have a professional engineering background. And there's a big difference between a kid who did a bunch of design courses in college a decade ago and someone who spent 30 years doing medical device R&D. And we have benefited not just in this project, but in all of our projects at UCSF within the surgical innovations group have benefited enormously from the expertise of both staff engineers and advisors who have some, like I said, up to 30 years of medical device R&D expertise and can really walk you through the process of doing this, not only making prototypes, but can advise you about all the hurdles that you're going to face along the way. And so I think that's a, if you're someone who works in academia who has a good idea, find someone who, you know, even if you have to convince them to work for cheap or for free to start off with, find someone who knows what they're talking about, because that can make a huge difference once you get to serious R&D work. I think the other two things that I think are big ones that people forget about are regulatory, like your regulatory pathway, because most people know the way that the features that you add to your device can really dictate what regulatory pathway you go down. As an example for our device, we were really hoping to fit it into a 510k pathway, something with a class two device, something that we just go into a standard 510k pathway, because that's going to shorten your time to market, time to approval, and subsequently the amount of funding that you need to raise to get there. And when we were thinking about features that we wanted to add on to this, we made it so that it just had the minimum feature set to get to, through it an easier regulatory pathway. And obviously, if you're making some implantable device that just, it's a class three device that's going to need a PMA, there's nothing you can do about that. But a lot of people, I think, are making simpler things. And if you have some leeway in design so that you fit into a different regulatory pathway, always try to pick the simplest one. This is not something that I really appreciated until you see what these timelines look like. And then I think funding is the other big one. So on the light, I think a lot of basic science research, which I've done quite a bit of in the past, and then other things like doing clinical research, where honestly, you really don't need that much money to actually do it. Developing medical devices is expensive, even initial prototyping. And most people don't want to give you money. If you just have an idea in your head, unless you're really experienced, no one's going to give you anything. And some universities might have a little bit of startup funds that you can get well, relatively low bar, but even at some of UCSF, where they, I think they support this quite a bit, there's a pretty high bar to getting even fifty dollars to $100,000 to do some prototyping work. And very competitive applications have sat now on the other side of the judging panel for our, what's called the Catalyst Program at UCSF, which is designed exactly for that, to help people get from like a concept or like a prototype to a real like quick concept device. And it's very competitive. And I think people need to, within their own institution and then externally, really explore what small grants are available because the threshold for meaningful venture capital money is seemingly very high compared to, especially compared to other industries. As an example, I have a friend from college who works in the sort of crypto web three space um, who raised a $6 million sheet around a 10 slide deck without a single line of code written. Now, he had some experience. Right. Pretty good seller then. Yeah. But again, the point is no team, no lines of code, like just him and an idea. There are very few people in the medical device space who could pull that off, right? And certainly not someone like me. So looking around for those small grants, the phase one SBIR type things, if you fall into a sort of relatively niche market, whether it's for pediatrics, the five pediatric device consortia around the U.S. that are funded by the federal government, they all have competitions where you can win up to $100,000. Each institution has little things going on. So it's important to find those because that's how you're going to get the money to pay that first engineer and to develop that first device that then is going to allow you to attract real money to I wanted to circle back to something you said, which was like the critique of the 510k pathway is that it almost incentivizes more incremental innovation within healthcare. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. I think that it's a poor balance that you have to face. And I think for us, like for this kidney pod device, there's other things that we would want to explain further on that'll just be, end up being like post-approval work that we'll do and we'll do tiered claims on top of the device. But getting it to market quickly, I think is important in this particular instance. Okay, so you can describe it as like the 510K is to your MVP, and then you can do the more elaborate stuff later. Yeah, you can do the more elaborate stuff once you have a little bit of traction. But like I said, this is not an implantable device. So, you know, all these people that are making some new cardiac valve or some hip replacement or whatever, the things that actually need to be 
that are class three that need to be a PMA, you can't get around that. But then again, you can also raise a lot more money for those because the amount of money that you can make on something like that is much more than on the device that I'm working with. Yeah. One more question before we move on is I can't move past this because I'm a book nerd, but of the entrepreneurship or venture capital articles and books you've read, was there one that stood out to you as a particularly helpful one? Yeah. The one that I really liked was Build by Tony Fidel. Yes. That is such a great book. Yeah. So if you haven't read this or not familiar, everyone thinks of Steve Jobs as like the iPhone guy and like, yes, Steve Jobs, fantastic. But Tony is really the one who made those things. He ran those projects and was really the brains behind all of that. And I learned so much just from reading that book about how to think about team building and how to think about how to present the device, whatever you're building to the world why it's important to really, even if you're the CEO of something, to care about the little details and how much of a difference that makes and so many other lessons. But it's really a fantastic book. It's one of those things that I picked up and finished in a couple of days and have skimmed through again from time to time as we're like prepping for something or oh, I got to go read, go back and read this section. Um, yeah. Or go find the podcast he mentions in the footnote and go listen to that. And yeah, really loved, loved that book. Yeah, and I think we did get a question about your program with UCSF, but I think before we get into that question, maybe can you just tell us more about the UCSF Surgical Innovations Fellowship, just in general, its goals and how it's impacted your career trajectory so far? Yeah, so the Surgical Innovations Fellowship is a two-year program that is open actually to any surgical trainee in the U.S. Often it's ended up being just based on interest levels. It's been one fellow from UCSF and one fellow from outside of UCSF, for example, in my year, it's myself, and then a resident Columbia named Tejas Sate, uh, who's amazing. And so he's been here now for a year and he's been this year to do the second year of the fellowship. And the way it's generally structured is that there's a bunch of like long-term ongoing projects at UCSF. And so the way that it's primarily structured is that most of the fellows have what we refer to as an anchor project. So one of these sort of long-term projects that's going on that as funding and the fellows will spend about half their time working on that. For myself, I work in Shubo Roy's lab at UCSF. He's the sort of engineering lead for the surgical innovations program. He's a bioengineer with a background in like MEMS work. And he has this long-term project called the kidney project, which the goal is to build a totally contained implantable bioartificial kidney. And so I work on one part of that, which is building and designing a kidney cell bioreactor. Um, so that sort of leverages my background in basic science and engineering, putting everything together. Depending on the day, I'm doing some CAD work. This morning I was building devices and putting cells in them. So it varies a little bit day to day, but everyone has an anchor project. That's mine. And then there are a bunch of other new projects that we work on developing. This year, our sort of overarching the, this year and next year, sort of overarching theme, we're operating with sustainability. And that can mean a number of different things. One is just like waste reduction. And another is like surgeon sustainability in the sense that lots of surgeons get musculoskeletal injuries. So thinking about surgical ergonomics. So we have a couple of projects that are ongoing in that space that Tejas and I have uh, sort of started from scratch. And really our primary focus at this point is developing a project around supply chain optimization with operating rooms at UCSF to reduce wasting costs. And so the two of us have been working closely with a lot of the both perioperative staff and start processing and supply chain people to try to figure out how to optimize some of those processes. Because unlike things like companies like Amazon and all your logistics companies or really any big company that has large inventories, hospitals tend to not do a very good job of keeping track of what they have, <laughs> unfortunately. And so we're working on a couple of projects to try to make a dent in that. Yeah, talk about a competing value between, I guess, sustainability and then sterilization, because those are two almost competing topics to try to optimize for. Yeah, no, for sure. It's the authority thing. And what most people might not realize is that healthcare accounts for about a third of the carbon emissions in the U.S. And the operating room is the biggest, if you break it out into like segments, the operating room is the biggest part of that. 
actually, between the very high use of disposables and then some of the anesthetic gases, which they're slowly phasing out. But um, some of the, the off-gassing from the anesthetic gases is what OR cases can be equivalent of a large plane flying across the country, which sounds ridiculous, but that's how potent some of these OR gases are. They now, the particular one that caused all this problem, they've stopped using it UCSF, but there's still lots of places around the country that do. Getting back to the rest of the components of the Surgical Innovations Fellowship, there's lots of other programming around that you can get involved in. UCSF has a Life Sciences for Entrepreneurship class that's run out of innovation group that where they bring in basically like big name people to give lectures on all different parts of how you develop life science technology. Examples would be like for normal, who's one of the big medical device and pharma, biopharma, IP lawyers founded that sort of space in the Bay Area. Um, they had Steve Blank, who founded the Launchpad, a bunch of big name people across all the different aspects of medical technology development who come in give lectures. It's a couple hours to be very interactive. So that has been great. We have the Catalyst program at UCSF, which as I said, is our own like sort of mini accelerator. There's funding and both funding and advice attached to teams that get have successful applications. And so I work on the back end with them a little bit now, but actually got started in that as an intern while I was a third year resident. They have an internship program that I applied to. And I actually worked on this kidney pod project intentionally through that, and that's how I originally spun up through there. Um, and then, as I said, we have this uses of Stanford Pediatric Device Consortium, which funds a bunch of different pediatric medical devices every year. And we host a weekly innovators forum, which is how Ty and I originally got to know each other, where we bring in medical device innovators or design people, everyone from all the different sort of spokes that form the wheel of medical device innovation and have them give presentations on what they're working on. The audience is a sort of variety of people with engineering, business, regulatory, clinical backgrounds, and you can get feedback, get put in the right direction for your needs within the UCSF ecosystem. And that's, you know, every week, and it's really a valuable resource for both understanding what's going on in the UCSF and Stanford and outside med device development world, age here with all these really smart people give feedback about other people's projects. And I learned something new every single week just for hearing people who are much smarter and more experienced than me talk about how they might direct a project that's from to us. Those are just some of the sort of opportunities that are available through there. It was such a fun experience to get to come be invited to be part of that. Yeah. I didn't realize you were part of the Catalyst program. If you don't mind the pop question, then target product profiles. Uh, yes. <laughs> and do you mind describing that real quick? Because it just doesn't yeah, a mechanism for a early stage for um, a device development. Yeah. So basically, just to explain, each project that gets accepted into the Catalyst program gets between fifteen and $100,000 worth of funding. But then you get assigned a team of advisors and interns um, who are usually graduate students or residents like me. And you put together what's called a target product profile. You should almost think of it as a combination of the lean business canvas and all the components of what the actual device are. And so I don't have it in front of me, so I can't remember all the segments, but it's like the device different. description, the instructions for use. You put together a competitive analysis, like a sort of mini version of a business plan, but you know what the regulatory pathway is, what your IP strategy is going to be. So all the major, it basically forces you to think about all the major components of your device that an investor will want to hear about. And you get this team of people that help you with it. What people were put together equivalent of this many times over and people are learning as you go. And at the end of the day, I'm away with this document that's almost like a very fleshed out executive summary. And it both helps to have all of your thoughts in one place and then direct what you're going to do in the future. And so for our team, for the kidney pod team that went through this, that I interned on and now worked at, it was a really valuable experience to help us put down in writing what we already knew and understand what the gaps were and where we needed to get help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from other industries, it sounds like a product requirements document, but much more specialized to the surgical innovation space. Very cool. Yeah. And they have different ones, Catalyst, not only funds medical devices, but they fund digital health products. They fund more like pharma and basic science kind of things. And they have their target product profile. The sort of format is different depending on what the 
the sort of category of the technology is. So it's very specialized to whether you're developing a diagnostic and therapeutic device, digital health product. We did get a really good question from Franklin in the audience and sticking on the idea of the resources that you have available to you. Does the UCSF program have an ensemble of consultants and advisors to assist their innovation fellows in the business regulatory components of like bench to commercialization? Yeah, so we do, which is really helpful. And some of them, I don't know how the financial structure works. I think some of them are volunteer. Some of them are on some kind of a retainer, but there's a whole the roster of people who have connections to both the UCSF Stamper Pediatric Device Consortium and the greater sort of innovations ecosystem at UCSF. And it's very easy to, once you get plugged in, to get put in touch with the right people, just to sit down and have a call, sort of work through some of the questions that you have. We very frequently do that for different devices that come through our surgical innovations forum. And then even through for the kidney pod project, which has gotten some funding through UCSF, we've been introduced to like our lead advisor, actually through the Catalyst program, and a number of other really like amazing resources. And that's something that's been cultivated over time by the leadership of these programs. So this isn't something that just happened overnight. These programs have existed for well over a decade. And so it's slowly cultivated this group of really fantastic business people, engineers, serial entrepreneurs, executives, you, you name it, there's probably someone who can give you some decent advice about it. So that's, I think, one of the sort of superpowers of this like Bay Area med tech ecosystem. We've been talking about some serious stuff for a while, and I did want to lighten the mood with more of a fun question about yeah. your favorite inventors and innovators since you're following in some great footsteps. And so what are some of them that have inspired you to where you are today? Yeah. Yeah, it's fun to think about that kind of stuff. Who are the people you're like, man, I want to be like them when I grow up. I think at UCSF, and particularly in our group, the person that really stands out to all of us is Mike Harrison. So Dr. Harrison is a pediatric surgeon, now emeritus faculty at UCSF, and basically invented an entirely new field of surgery and a lot of devices that go along with that. Prior to him, when kids had various prenatally diagnosed issues, there was really nothing you could do about it. And he basically invented the field of fetal surgery, where you actually go in and do operations on unborn babies and fix the problems that they have. And there are a number of medical devices that are named after him as a result of some of these inventions that he made. It. There aren't very many people in the world that do these kinds of operations, but he's trained most of them. And the legacy of sort of pediatric device development really just comes through him. And so every year there's a Harrison Symposium that's held at UCSF that hosts our pediatric device consortium. And it's just a big meeting of all of the people that have worked under him over the last five decades. He's still there every year on meetings, but I don't know if he was at our surgical innovations for a meeting, but he's still in our meetings every week, even though he's retired and, and is still working on some medical devices. But he's a fantastic resource, always so excited about everything that the surgical innovations fellows and the people in the pediatric device consortium worked on. That's so cool to have your hero as a mentor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's so cool and such an interesting and visionary person. And then outside of medicine, one of the people that when I was young, I was really into aviation. My grandfather was a flight mechanic in the Korean War, and I used to build lots of model airplanes with him. And I could probably have told you about every plane in the civilian and military fleets when I was like 10. But there's uh, there's a guy named Bert Rutan who people may remember back when Virgin Atlantic was first getting started, but they sponsored this thing called Sansari X Prize, which was basically the, the temp, it was a $10 million prize for the first private like group to send someone into orbit. Up to that time, it had only been governments like NASA and the Russian Space Agency were the only people who had ever sent people into space. And for less than $25 million, this guy, Buru 10, developed the thing called the Spaceship One, which was built out of all these sort of fancy composite materials that had never been used in aerospace before. And I think it was the early 2000s, they sent the first people into space from a private company. And it was really like him and a handful of other engineers who did this. And it was to me, really an inspiration for how you can use like repurpose technologies that are used for other things with these composite materials that no one had used for aerospace before. 
were used to build these super fast, super light airplanes that could take people into space and survive the whole sort of journey for $25 million, which is effectively nothing. It's like a rounding arrow when it comes to the NASA budget or something like SpaceX mm-hmm. and things like that. And it, to be able to send some of the space, but that is kind of uh, fantastic. And that technology was then used for some of the Richard Branson, Virgin Atlantic, uh, private space stuff. And so growing up, he was one of my like heroes. I love that. And then I guess just like looking towards your own career, you in your program currently, but at the same time, just looking towards the future, what kind of innovation really gets you going? What do you want to work in now that the reins are going to be turned over to you as you're the next generation? Yeah. So I think that two things that are really important to me are, so one, I'm so, despite the fact that I've worked all these sort of kidney and transplant things, I'm actually going to be specializing in colorectal surgery, which is a field that sort of innovation has been dominated really by two things, the intuitive Da Vinci surgical robot, and then like precision medicine, like cancer stuff, colorectal surgeons do all the colorectal cancer. There's hasn't honestly been that much device or other sort of like medical technology innovation in colorectal surgery. Um, so I think it's a field that is ripe for some technological disruption. And while patients generally do pretty good, there's still a bunch of big unsolved problems in the field. And so I'm really looking forward to like digging into that. And then the other thing that I see, which was a big part of the impetus for me transitioning out of all the basic science that I had done in undergrad and medical school was that I saw so many really brilliant people around me have these, what seemed like great ideas that never went anywhere. And I'll tell you some about surgeons, some about basic science researchers, but it seems like there is really a gap in teaching people like me how to develop medical devices out of Hmm. academic programs. And so my sort of career goal is for medical technology, innovation, surgical innovation to be on par with basic science research, with clinical outcomes research, with global health research in academic institutions. And if you look back 15, 20 years ago, in clinical research, outcomes research, you weren't really a serious academic surgeon unless you ran a lab. And now that's can be further from the truth. In fact, less and less surgeons are running labs now, and more and more people are doing clinical research and outcomes research. And so my hope is to have a career that is both focused on building devices and then expanding the academic footprint of medical technology innovation so that it's something that you're learning about in medical school, you're learning about in residency, that people are specializing in this technology development within their field and other fields and are able to spin that out into things that actually are able to help patients. Sort of the way I think about it is that at the end of the day, every single thing that we use in the operating room to do our jobs had to be formed out of a company, had to be manufactured. The idea that we shouldn't interact and work closely with industry, I think, is not right. So I hope that over the course of my career, we can find a way to really normalize that, make it so that people with great ideas can learn how to turn it from not just a great idea, but actually get it all the way to the finish line in a more structured way than the happenstance that I think happens a lot now. It's fascinating. And I think also you talking about bright ideas and good ideas, talking about the future of technologies right now. We're living in an age where new things are coming out all the time. I know Ty and I love messing around chat GPT. And so for you, what also is interesting you as far as like on the emerging technology side? Yeah, you're talking about AI. I think that it's already disrupted so much, but even within academia, if you go look at every publishing house now, you basically either have to attest to a statement that you didn't use chat GPT or they explicitly say you are not allowed to like <laughs> use large language models to write your papers. And I think the reality is that, do you remember a time when you didn't use, when spell check wasn't a thing? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I don't. (laughs) So I think the reality, whether people want to accept it or not, is that these technologies are going to continue to evolve and are permanent. They're not going, maybe they'll be regulated. Sam Altman was just in front of Congress talking about regulation for AI. And I think there'll probably be some degree of regulation, but these technologies are not going away. And nature, science, cell, like all these big um, publications have basically come out like against it. And my perspective is I think that it's a little ignorant. I think the reality is that these are going to be adopted. They're going to be used. And I think they're going to be used to make things better. 
and faster and more efficient. And we need to embrace them because it's going to allow technology to evolve for the betterment of patient care, hopefully faster. So that's one of the things that I really think is going to change a lot in the next and at different applications of it that I probably have no conception of how you use this technology, but how it can really help advance medicine. There's a number of issues with that in terms of the traceability. So being able to have the large language model be able to replicate its results, but that then degrades its performance, even just in the case of submitting, say, a journal article, being providing proper attribution to how much did it contribute? Did you just sign your name to something that came out of chat GPT or did you like, was it the bad first draft? And then you had a lot of heavy editing. So I think the nature of which it gets included as a co-author starts to get interesting. So are you assigning personhood to the large language model at that point? There's all kinds of interesting issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very interesting ethical issues and like you say the authorship thing but it's a very powerful tool i took the uh just as an example one of the last papers that i had accepted i took the introduction of it and it basically asked it to write the introduction from scratch just by giving like a one line overview about what the article was about and then ChatGPT is not very good about picking out academic references yet so i just fed it the references and it wrote a almost verbatim like 800 word introduction <laughs> compared to what i actually wrote so with a little bit of guidance, it's frighteningly powerful. And so I see why people want to have some reins on it. And mm -hmm. I think pulling the blinders over and saying, oh, we're just not going to accept that this is a reality is not the right approach. I think it needs to be safely embraced. Right. It's the, probably the right way to think about it. Absolutely. So I know we've got maybe a couple more questions left in this whole thing. Yeah. Something I think we also are very interested in that's been coming up a lot. And Ty's been speaking about this on TikTok is physician burnout. <laughs> And like you in particular, like you were taking on so much more than even other surgical fellows because you're on the innovation side as well. And so how do you manage your life? Obviously, you said you have a wife as well. You obviously have a life outside of medicine, outside of your career. And uh, are you noticing that it's becoming a problem or do you think that physician burnout happens as a systemic issue, as a personal issue, someone can't manage their own life? Just what's your take on it in general? Yeah, I, th I certainly think that there are massive systemic components to this. At least I can't speak for everyone, but for trainees, a lot of, I think, the burnout comes from a lack of control over your life. And I will say that even though right now, because I have this day job with surgical innovations and then this company that I work for on the side, which is all of my free time before and after work, unless I'm riding my bike or hanging out with my wife, I actually feel less burned out now. Or I actually think I would say my life is great right now because I have control over my time and I'm working on exactly what I want to do. And I love being a surgeon. I have no plans to leave training at all, but that lack of control over your life, I think is what leads to a lot of burnout. If you go into a week knowing that you're going to work hundred hours that week and that you're going to be doing all these big surgeries, like, great. I, I'm totally happy if you want me to be operating a hundred hours a week. I think it's the the expectation versus the reality is what really can get to some people. And especially for as medicine becomes more like administrative, the heavy, like the things that drive you crazy are when you are doing these things that don't really feel like they're moving patient care forward, that you're just doing it because someone else told you you had to check some box or that there was some protocol that someone who has no interaction with the actual like clinical medical system came up with. Those are the kinds of things that kind of drive you towards burnout. And then I will say not having enough time for your personal life can affect things. I think everyone is different. For me, the thing that really makes a big difference is being able to exercise enough and spend quality time with my wife and my family. I think if you do that in a very intentional way in training, you can really mitigate the amount of quote unquote burnout that you experience. But again, a lot of that is dictated by how predictable or unpredictable your schedule is. And surgical training can be very unpredictable. I would say that having control over your life probably makes the biggest difference. And even if you're working a lot, like I am now, like I'm working on all the things that I'm really passionate about. And so it doesn't seem like that much work. It seems like yeah, you're, gonna be yeah, you're very creative in your work. And so you're advancing the field and you're plugged into the mission of making medicine better. Like even though you might have current day-to-day -day frustrations, it's tied into that larger mission. Yeah. I think that having a big picture mission really helps. And honestly, it, it helps make the minutia even better when you're frustrated about something you're like, yeah, you know what? It's fine because it's for something that really matters. Whereas sometimes 
clinical medicine, you feel like you're just banging your head against a wall. That's why every surgeon, their happy place should be in the operating room because there you're there and fixing a problem. And that's what makes all of us happy. It makes when I do some moonlighting, when I'm on research and every time I'm in the operating room in the middle of night, I'm reminded about why I love this job because there's a person who has a problem in front of you that you can fix. And that's the ultimately the most satisfying part, the whole job. Just closing things up here, what advice or recommendations would you give to clinicians and physicians that are interested in pursuing the route that you're on right now? Yeah, I think that to me, it was very intimidating and I almost didn't know where to start. And I would say almost it just keeps so many, you'll find one thing that looks like a small opportunity, like the college internship program, and you'll get introduced to some people through one person or people through another person. You'll, you'll bother someone that you really want to work with over and over again. And a bunch of people say no, but someone's going to say yes. And that's going to open the doors for you. I think it's very hard for people who come from a traditional, like academic medical background where they're just used to, these are the hoops in front of you, jump through the hoops. Doing this is very different than that. So it can be very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable for me. And I know it's very uncomfortable for a lot of people to go through this very nebulous, different process of developing medical devices. It's giving yourself some space to just say, it's okay. A lot of things are going to go wrong here. I don't really know what the path forward is, but I'm just going to plow through the door. And I think that has really opened up this whole world for me that I didn't know existed 18 months ago. And it's it's been a philosophy that I, I think benefits anyone who wants to do any kind of medical device development, med tech development, entrepreneurship kind of work. Wonderful. And on that note, Dr. Tom Sorrentino, thank you for your time. We really appreciate your insights. Look for us on TikTok, Spotify, YouTube. And yeah, just thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, Jared, Ty, thanks so much for having me. Awesome. It was great talking to you today, Tom.